It's haiku time again. Today at Poetry P, we've recorded haiku for you to enjoy, mostly based on the challenge to write using food kigo. As to why I think they're all haiku, well, put simply, there's a principle that haiku have kigo. And here, in this case, food is acting as our kigo. It should take you to a particular season and hopefully awaken something in you for good or evil. Now I know there's a school of thought that says that haiku are purely and simply nature poems. I disagree, and we'll be working on putting together a more comprehensive case over this year. Watch this space. And perhaps sign up for our email on the website, because I'll probably use that to test out some theories with you. Then again, there's a school of thought that thinks Kigo can only be dictated by the Japanese sajiki. Again, I disagree at least as far as English language haiku goes. We're a global bunch. Haiku is, I believe, the most quantitative genre of poetry written globally. And as such, I think we can look to evoke the season and our relationship with it from a personal point of view. Write an authentic piece. And if we're true to ourselves, there's a good chance that there are readers who'll get something from our haiku. Not necessarily what you had in mind. Have you seen my interview with Bruce H. Feingold in episode 3 of this series? Anyway, they'll enjoy your poem nonetheless. There will be more thoughts on these points throughout the coming months. So, I've chatted on and come off topic. Let's go back to my original point. We've got lots of haiku for you to enjoy today. And when I say we, I'm joined by an all-female panel, myself, Patricia, obviously, as well as Alison Whipple, who did the presentation for this topic back in Series 5. As well as Alison, I'm joined by Doris Lynch, Janice Doppler and Joanne Morecambe, all good friends of the podcast and experienced writers themselves. They are our panel of judges this time. I know who they've chosen. You'll find out in a minute. Oh, and before I go on, March is a major submission month. 1st to the 15th, it's Haiku and Senryu. We're reimagining some classics. You'll find the inspiration for your poems in episode one of this series and copies of the poems we're, we are reimagining. That's really hard to say, a bit of a tongue twister. Copies of the poems we're reimagining are in the show notes for that episode too. Now, this is important. Please don't just rehash the poem. I know you have the skills to allude to them to write a poem about where they take you in your head, or perhaps you'll just update the scenario in the poems. Let's see. Be imaginative, that's the point. And our team are waiting with bated breath to find out what you can do. Send your submission. Tell your friends to submit. Did I mention January was a record submission month? Let's break that record, shall we? Also, Poetry P will be accepting submissions of split sequences from the 16th to the 31st of March. If you haven't got a clue what I'm on about, have you not listened or watched PTV readings with Peter Jastermski and Brian Rickett, now, of course, the illustrious leader of the Haiku Society of America? Well, you can go and have a listen to that or watch The Terrible Two in action whilst waiting for the first podcast of next month, when I'm joined by Peter once again. We had some fun doing a workshop for you. It'll be out on the first Monday of March. But now before I go on, I have an apology to make. I messed up. Gary Blackwell wrote a lovely piece for the open submissions last year and I totally forgot to read it to you and I forgot to put it in the journal. But I want to put that right today because there's nothing better than listening to your work being acknowledged and read out and then reading it in print. I'm sorry, Gary, really I am. So here's Gary's poem. Summer's sun burns a desiccated segment, my skin peels. Summer's sun burns a desiccated segment, my skin peels. Gary Blackwell. His poem will be in the next journal, promise Gary. Speaking of which, have you downloaded the latest one? You know where you can find the link, and the proceeds will be going towards a new website. 
We've outgrown our current one, and I can't create it myself. At least I can't create one that will do you justice. So I'm going to get it professionally done. Shall we hear Linda's choices from January's video prompt? Linda, thank you so much for reading them all and choosing your favourites to feature here and in the journal. You know you have to be in it to win it, so head over to our YouTube page and leave your poems in the comments. It's free to use. And while you're there, have a look at some of the resources we offer. And maybe click on the subscribe button. So, here are Linda's choices from January 2023. Sea Lion Knowing how to read the crowd for a handout. Kim Clue Passing time along the quay. Sea Lions. Kerry J. Heckman. Basking in the summer sun. Grandad's whiskers. Marilyn Ward. A masterly craft at catching the limelight. Promenade seal. Robert Kingston. In the end, just a drop in the ocean. Keith Everts. Congratulations to all our poets. And now on to the original Food Kigo section. My thanks to the editing team, Robert Horobin, Liam Maguire, Vandana Parashar, and Ronald K. Craig. No Lorraine this time, she'll be back in March. This month was quite difficult to edit. Many poets used two Kigo, one being the food, but often they then used a reference to an actual season. So I took the decision that we would reject any such haiku if the season mentioned was stronger than the food kigo. It was actually a very difficult road to travel, and you may disagree with us sometimes, but we've done our best. But this meant we rejected some really cracking haiku. But as we have a very fast turnaround, hopefully poets could get those great pieces submitted elsewhere. I'm going to start today with the first of our judges' choices. I'd like to welcome Doris Lynch to the podcast for the first time, although regular listeners will know her work. Hello, Doris. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, yeah, great to be here. <laughs> you know, it's our second time of trying, but at least we got there in the end, didn't we? Yes, yeah. <laughs> now, Doris, I know you and I have got something in common. We're both um, mentors for the Haiku Society of America. So no mm -hmm. pressure but your mentees will be expecting a really tip-top analysis from you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, no, no pressure. So uh, shall we hear which poem you've chosen and then why? Yes, definitely. Although I call no the orange cat nibbling the cicada shell. Although I call no the orange cat nibbling the cicada shell. And this haiku is by Deborah A. Bennett. My new mantra, never read delicious haiku before breakfast. Winberries, pumpkin soup, plum cake. My tummy began rumbling. But having lived through two 17-year succumb seasons, Deborah Palm called to me. Her first line, although I call no, draws you in. The capitalized no followed by an exclamation point, informs the reader that it's a strong negative. But who is being addressed? A loved being, obviously, but child, sibling, or spouse. Line two solves the conundrum, an orange cat. We've all been surprised, even horrified, by the edibles cats attack with gusto. This tabby doesn't gulp, but nibbles. What wonderful delicacy is this? An excellent word choice to describe the cat's ecstasy at a new treat, the cicada shell. The poem's cut between phrase and fragment occurs just before line threes, the cicada shell. Although I call no implies disobedience. It also shows the emotion of the speaker. The reader infers that she wants to protect her pet's well-being. Line two show, shows the writer's familiarity with cat behavior the orange cat nibbling. 
It delights with a fine soundscape, the half rhymes of although and no, the short eye sounds of nibbling repeated in the musical cicada, and the soft C and S sounds found in cicada and shell. Going deeper, I like how this poem hints at the psychology of people and pets. Will the loud command matter? Will Kitty drop his delicious treat? No, the human will know she tried her best to restrain Kitty's food gathering. Both will remain overwhelmed by thousands of rotting amber casings. Sonata season is a time to marvel about a biological event when billions of insects rise from the earth after 17 years to feed birds, squirrels, and shall I say it, orange cats. If it's good enough for fancy DC restaurants, then let Kitty nibble at this feast of the gods. Cicada time is brief. Deborah has opened a window into its chaos, complexity, and gustatory power. Her no echoes that of many animal keepers who try to protect their beloved pets from the world's hazards, even those that become temporary pleasures. Brilliant. Thanks, Doris. Doris, you know, when I was reading the submissions for this topic, I spent quite a lot of time Googling recipes. There were a number of dishes that I want to try, but perhaps not this one. I think I'll leave Deborah's cat <laughs> to the cicadas. I did mention that we rejected many cracking poems this time because they had two kigo, food and a more obvious one. But when we had the time, we went back to the poet and asked them to rework their pieces if they didn't mind. And if this ever happens to you, please don't be afraid to say no, because at the end of the day, they're your poems. Anyway, this poem fell into that category. So Doris, when you chose it, I did a quick consult with Deborah and she's happy I share something with you and all our listeners. This was her original haiku. Summer dusk, the orange cat nibbling the cicada shell. Summer dusk, the orange cat nibbling the cicada shell. So we have the summer dusk and the cicada shell. Summer being rather a stronger kigo, we thought. But as it was submitted early in the submission period, I was able to ask Deborah to have another look at it. And she was happy to do so. So putting you on the spot, sort of, Doris, (laughs) how does this change the poem for you? Well, um, the original one, I'm drawn to the sunset, the post-sunset, the colours, the lavenders, the reds, the oranges. And when you go to, although I say no, she added that instead, I guess. Mm -hmm, Yeah. Yeah. But when you go to the the cat and the cicada there, you're actually looking up for a sunset and, and then just find out what your cat is doing. You're looking down. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a jump from the beauty and there's also a jump from what the reader will be doing. So it seems like a timescape that isn't in the moment to me. So mm-hmm. that jumped me out of the moment. And okay. also my attention is divided between beauty and between <laughs> the cat uh, finagling in the ground within the ground to eat this being that it finds luscious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. I mean, personally, I mean, I quite like the first version if, um, you know, any other topic and I, I, I wouldn't have gone back probably to Deborah, but this was you know, specifically for the Fukigo topic. So I did. But I do love the dynamism that the new line one brings to the poem. So yeah. yeah. I, I, it, I think it, it really works. Yeah, it does. Now, Doris, before you go, or before we go on to discuss all the poems that we're going to hear, can you please read your submission for us? Sure. Wild strawberries, stained hands tote, Mom's Empty Basket Home. Wild strawberries, stained hands tote, Mom's Empty Basket Home. Thanks, Doris. I think your mentees will be very proud of you. Lackluster marriage. She glazes the crust of an apple pie. Ravi Karan. Every bite a possibility. Oatmeal with raisins. Benny Courage. 
Rocky Road, Navigating Mountains of Ice Cream, Chris Langer. Steam from sidewalk grates, hot oatmeal for the homeless. Kurt Paulish. Scorching heat, in her pot, green figs budding. Toyet Van Do. A pyramid of apples, the many things on mother's mind. Minal Sarosh. Minal, as a mum myself, I can really identify with that poem. Thank you. First snow. I stir the milk into my cappuccino. Daniela Miso. A huge bonfire cleans up the harvest. Vina roast. Jan Stretch Do they still have huge bonfires of fields, I wonder? I haven't seen one for years. Let me know. Canola fields. Glowing golden valley swaying in the breeze. Rob McKinnon A sweet sip of eggnog, the warmth of her mother's laugh. Kimberly Kucha. Buzzing bees, one wrapped in cobweb for a spider's late lunch. Giddy Nielsen Sweep. Plum cake, siblings fight for the last bite. Lakshmi Iyer. Our outstretched legs, the bowl of strawberries still warm. Wei Mai Wong. I watch you grow up, sweet peas. Catherine E. Winnick. Cucumber sandwiches without the crusts. A yellow butterfly. Alison Douglas Turner. Blizzard over, the marmite jar, empty. Christopher Jupp All those books that I will never read. Fallen apples. Marie Durley Durian season, the distinctive stench in the market. Kevin Brown Kevin, I've never smelt the durian. Perhaps that's a good thing. Clam bake. Every chin shines with summer. John Pappas. And now I'd like to thank everyone who bought the podcast to coffee last month, bringing us a step nearer to having an intern to help me with all this content that I bring you. So thank you to Christopher Pays, Paul Callas, Anne Smith, Susan, Michael Flanagan, Jerome Berglund, Emily, Linda Ludwig, Tony Williams, Kerry Heckman, Anna Part, Kimberly Kucher, Susan Andrews, Colette Kern, Wendy Blomseth and Eve Castle. And of course, to those of you who chose to stay anonymous, you know who you are, and I thank you too. And just a quick reminder that the latest journal, 322, is out now. And I'd like to thank all of you who bought it. And of course, if you haven't bought it, it's still available. I'm going to put together a new website, which I hope will make accessing Poetry Peace so much easier and so much more pleasing to the eye. I can't do it myself. We've outgrown my capabilities, so I'm going to get a profi, as we say here, to do it for me. And if I'm honest, I'm really not looking forward to it, but it has to be done. And all the proceeds from the journal will be going towards the new site. 
So thank you very much if you've bought it and if you buy it in the future. So on with the poetry. Bit of beef, crumb of cheese, a ghost of Christmas past. Jerome Berglund. Rosca de Reyes, she finally finds Jesus. Adele Evershed. Cranberry season. Months of the divorce saga with its sour taste. Natalia Kuznetsova. Back home, the smell of lemon pickle in each room. Mona Beddy. Shelling pistachios, the wind before the rain. Cynthia Anderson. Not a sound but the falling of apples. The crow's breakfast. James Young. Runaway, the herb garden, now a mint farm. Marilyn Ashbow. Marilyn, in a previous garden, I made the mistake of planting mint straight into the soil. Never again. What a complete and utter nuisance it became. Surrounding the crematorium, New Rice Sprouts, Charles Harper. Long Night, a lemon ripening on my desk, Jackie Chow. Portofino Cafe, tuna and scampi in a sea of olive oil, Bruce H. Feingold. Peeling green mangoes in the garden. A sleeping Buddha. Lafcadio. Matching my brown spots, bananas in a bowl. Petro CK. Scent of citrus, the bitterness of our morning marmalade. Christine Wink Harrison Salmon Run The lure of alder smoke at the river's edge Bill Fay Mince Pie, Not Words Richard Bailey Stirring and stirring the pumpkin soup until I disappear. Sebastian Rivon. Crab apples, the sour taste of deception. Paul Callas. Honey and lemon, unable to taste my own medicine. Tracy Davidson. Deep in the Winburys, Purple Tongues, Anne Smith. And I wonder if Winbury is a word used by certain cultures or in certain regions. I haven't heard it for a long, long time. Grilled cheese, one season melts into another. Colette Kern. Down by the river, just one more berry picking. Christopher Pays. Now, shall we find out who our next nominee is for the judge's choice? Janice, also the first time to the podcast, welcome. Thank you. 
And um, I was saying before we started recording, I feel like I know you because we've been in so many sort of conference and Zoom calls together, but it really is the first time you've been with us. Yes, it is. Tell us, who did you choose and why? I chose a haiku by Bona M. Santos. And the haiku is backyard picnic. The smell of grilled fish lingers on my hair. Backyard picnic. The smell of grilled fish lingers on my hair. The backyard picnic and the smell of fish lingering on the speaker's hair are strong images. Grilled fish is the main food kigo. I interpret backyard picnic as a food related kigo that shouts summer, at least in parts of, at least in many parts of the world. The verse has a pleasant rhythm with two pauses. The main pause after backyard picnic creates space between the background picnic and the foreground smell of fish. A shorter pause between the parts of the foreground image creates space to savor the smell of grilled fish before revealing the surprise of the scent lingering on hair. This masterful use of ma promotes pondering during repeated readings. Is the poet hosting the picnic or is she a guest? Is it a small gathering or a large party? A quiet picnic with lots of conversation or does blaring music add a festive energy while making conversation hard to hear? Is the picnic a celebration of a graduation, a birthday, an engagement, a one-time event, just bringing people together? There's a sense of mystery in this verse. Is the fish scent lingering because the poet is the griller at the picnic and she was exposed to the fish for a long time? Who notices the scent on her hair? Children who giggle at the smell? A romantic partner who notices after the picnic ends? Someone else? Santos's backyard picnic triggered memories of those that I have experienced. And it was a pleasure this week to ponder this particular picnic, those in my past, and to imagine my next picnic. Thanks, Janice. Thanks for the analysis. I don't know about you, but when I read this poem aloud, I imperceptibly took a breath at the end of the first line, just like, you know, if you were taking a breath to to smell the fish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, yes. that knows the air. Um, and also, I, I noticed when you were doing the um, the analysis, you quite often use the word scent of the, the fish, fish scented hair, um, uh, the fish scent lingering. But Bona used smell. And I wondered what you thought of her choice of the word smell as opposed to scent. Had that struck you? I did. And I was aware that as I was writing the the um my comments, I was aware that I that I was writing scent. But in the haiku itself, I think I like it the way it, it is because smell and grilled and and lingers. So there's all of those L sounds in there that add strength to the haiku. When I wrote scent in my comments, I decided to leave it because I thought it might be interesting to have just a different word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and possibly uh, because obviously I, I had a little read of it before um, we went to the recording. Possibly that's what really made the, the idea of the word smell stand out in, in my mind too. So thank you very much for that. And I'm very pleased that you mentioned about the ma in the poem. I think quite often it, it's a technique or would you call it a technique that that's overlooked we don't think about it often enough when we're putting our poems together so janice doppler thank you very much for your analysis and we will continue now with the poetry thank you you're welcome 
Homesickness. Potato and lentil stew. Warming weary hands. Danny Dor. Apple seeds. The beginning of so many plans. CX Turner. Among the oranges, a cherry tomato, imposter. Mark Brimble. Dispute Moon, sharing late tomatoes with a red-bellied cooter. Joshua Sinclair. I had no idea what a red-bellied cooter was. I was happily surprised when I looked it up. One of my favourite little animals. Olive oil glides over ripe tomatoes. Lazy evening sun. Annie Wilson. First persimmon. His father's quad cane still upright. Matt Snyder. Leibkuchen, the bounce in the bathroom scale. P. H. Fisher. Slow dance, young couples cutting rice. Mariangela Kanzi. Roadside fruit stand, everything passes the taste test. Richard Tice. Bit of a tongue twister there, Richard. Thank you very much. Not many choices before surgery. Rice porridge. Kathleen Tice. Scent on the city bus. Matsuyama oranges. Mimi Ahern. Rubbing my thumb against each bruise. Windfall apples. Megan Collins. Harvesting pods in the dead lotus pond. Love songs. Christina Chin. Oh, have you ever seen a pond full of lotus flowers? In bloom, obviously. Or indeed, just with the pods. Absolutely beautiful. Thanks, Christina. Brought back lovely memories, that. Blueberry pancakes. Homemade batter bubbling with garden berries. Douglas J. Lanzo. Holy catharsis, jabbing Christmas oranges with cloves. Anne Morrigan. Flaxseed lados, grand's warmth on a chilly day. Avinda Kaur. Pumpkin spice latte, mum promises she'll make soup. By Sally Chatterjee Doot. Squabbling over the last mince pie, two crows. Claire Tom. Time for another nomination, I think. Remember I said we were going to be joined by Joanne Morecambe? Well, I'm afraid... The internet fairies were not with us and she couldn't get logged in to the link I sent her. No worries, we have her analysis anyway, so I'll read it to you. Thanks, Joanne. Gooseberry juice, gulping bitterness down to beat ageing. Gooseberry juice, gulping bitterness down to beat ageing. Vipanjet Kaur Before encountering this unique haiku, I'd never heard of gooseberry juice. Despite its bitter taste, it has many health benefits, including, perhaps, 
reversing the effects of ageing. Is it the fountain of youth? In our youth-obsessed world, many people would do almost anything to turn back the clock, even ingest something that tastes terrible. The poem is a somewhat humorous comment on a universal desire to avoid ageing, disease and death. To gulp and to beat imply making strong actions, since anything less will achieve nothing, and the ageing process will continue to the inevitable end. Also, bitterness may refer to the poet's state of mind as well as the juice. They may be feeling resentful about what they have to do to achieve their goal. Few haiku appeal to the sense of taste the way this one does. I can virtually taste the pungent juice in my mouth and throat as I read it. Perhaps, like the song, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down in the most delightful way. It's worth a try. Well, Joanne, I have to say... um, I wouldn't fancy the gooseberry juice. I've eaten gooseberries that are not quite ripe yet. And uh, it put me off eating them for the rest of my life. But there's uh, something else I wanted to say about the poem too. Gooseberry juice, or gooseberries are summer, late summer fruits to me. And in some way... Would the gooseberry juice reflect a sort of bitterness, a sadness that summer's coming to an end? And we can't beat that. We can't beat nature. We can't beat the seasons, can we? Just a thought. Anyway, back now to the poetry. Thanks, Joanne. Cowslip Field. This morning's fresh serving of scrambled eggs. Dorothy Burrows. Zucchini blossoms, the delicate flavour on my tongue. Desdemona for sun. Brussels sprouts, the mellowing of my mother. Wendy Ghent. Rainy farmer's market, I carry home lettuce and a slug. John S. Green. Fiddler's Green, eating wild blueberries on the way up. Marion Clark. County Fair, her grandfather pinches some cotton candy. Mark A. Forrester. Home for the holidays, mum's Irish dew boiling over. Laurie Kiefer. She has me at grilled asparagus. Speed dating. Reed Hepworth. Under two quilts, the smell of chicken noodle soup. Ronald K. Craig. Rolling boil, the rush to pick sweet corn. Sally Bigger. Ripe apple, all the sweetness of our silence. Samo Kreutz. Riot van stress break, cream eggs and pickled onion crisps. Tim Roberts. What a combo, Tim. Hometown visits. Papa and my walks a bag of peanuts long. Vandana Parashar. Stiff wind, the bolted lettuce, an ornament. Tony Williams. Turns out those lemons were oranges. Neighbourhood watch. Eavonka Ettinger. The taste of summer raspberries. Our first kiss. Malgazata Formanowska. Hopscotch. 
A half-eaten apple rolls on the pavement. Nina Singh First fig. The urge to shed those clothes. Mark Gilbert The bells from last night ring loud in my head. Paul Chapman Paul, that one reminded me of my father. Bells was one of his tipples. A drop of honey on my daughter's sketchbook. The setting sun. Devashruti Mandal. Next up is Alison Whipple, who's going to make her nomination. And Alison, I have to tell you, this was a very popular podcast, or should I say, your presentation was a very popular podcast. And if people want to go back to it, it was at the end of last year in series five, number 24. It had a record breaking number of submissions. And I was particularly pleased that there are so many new poets. I don't know if you noticed that, that they were involved this time. Although I was missing some of our old regulars, and I hope they'll be back for the next submission in March. So welcome back, Alison. How did you enjoy it? Thank you. I loved reading these <laughs> so much. And I did notice that there were a number of new names um, that I hadn't seen before. Um, and I said in our email that um, one of the things that really stood out to me was the level of depth in some of these haiku. And that was not a thing I was intentionally reading for, but I really noticed how really how these really some of them really took it to another level in terms mm. of emotional impact cultural impact so tell us in the end which one did you find really stood stood out for you all right i have selected uh krista pandy's haiku christmas tamales immigrants try out texas traditions christmas tamales immigrants try out texas traditions the tamale is a quintessential Texas holiday food, in part because making a large batch of them is labor intensive and requires the participation of many family members. Tamales are a Mexican dish first documented in 1519 in what is now the state of Veracruz. And in my lifetime, the state of Texas has always had an unfortunately hostile relationship toward the Mexican and Central American immigrants that cross its borders, whether documented or not. However, Texas as a state has always been a site for immigrants. The port of Galveston was as busy as Ellis Island in the early 20th century, despite not being as famous. Central Texas is also well known for its German communities. In fact, Crystal City, Texas housed an internment camp for German immigrants in World War II. In the present day, while Mexicans do make up the highest proportion of immigrants in Texas, immigrants from India are in second place, followed by El Salvador and then Vietnam, and it should be noted that Mesoamerican countries such as El Salvador have their own versions of tamales. Krista Pandy's haiku is deceptively simple, but in three lines, she invokes not just a season, but also the evolving nature of a food, as well as the complicated nature of immigration in the United States. In this short commentary, I don't have space to elaborate on the complexities of Mexican, Spanish, and United States politics, but for those of us versed in that history, food becomes a contentious ground for exploring history and heritage. I imagine the immigrants in this haiku are of European and or Asian ancestry. They are trying a new holiday tradition that is connected not just to the warmth and connection of family, but also to the fraught nature of history. This is a haiku that manages to bring depth through seasonal associations. Thanks, Alison. This is another one of those recipes that I, I had to look up and will be trying at some point in the future. Alison, you've, you've illustrated the depth of this poem. I wasn't aware really myself, or I hadn't thought about it when I was reading it myself, how much history is wrapped up in this little seven word poem. I don't know about you, but it struck me as sort of ironic that we had immigrants trying out Texas traditions and the tradition itself is sort of an immigrant too. And really what we think of as Tex-Mex cuisine is when, you know, when Mexican immigrants came to Texas, you couldn't always get what you could get in interior Mexico. You know, Texas did used to be part of the Mexican territory. Yeah. 
and was colonized and that's a whole story uh, <laughs> but for people from say the yucatan which is quite different from central texas you couldn't get things uh in there so a lot of tex-mex is really a fusion of this is what you made do with these foods that we associate with a region are doing your best with what you have uh, yeah because you can't get what you had you know back in the in the old country and quite apart from the food i hadn't realized that texas uh that galveston had been uh, you know a second ellis island i hadn't realized that it was such a busy port for it for immigration i so... hadn't either and it was a, a poet friend of mine she was of jewish ancestry and so many of her family actually came in through the port of galveston so fascinating thank you thank you very much i'm gonna have to go and uh and look all of that up now. Anyway, Alison, thank you. Thank you for that nomination. Could you please close out the podcast by reading your submission, please? Yeah. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, happy to share this one. Canning applesauce. Traditions cross generations. Canning applesauce. Traditions cross generations. And Alison, another uh, poem involving traditions. And when when I read this, I wondered if it reflected the joy of the discoveries you're making having moved state. Your partner's family have got a farm, yes? Yes, his mother has a farm. Um, these particular apples did not come from that farm. Oh. Uh, what do you do when you, uh, when you receive a bushel of 4-H apples for Christmas that you can't possibly eat? <laughs> all at once and also they're not really the best straight eating apples okay. you make applesauce and then your nephew won't eat you know regular mm -hmm. all the applesauce anymore it has to be the fancy applesauce <laughs> <laughs> fair enough but i also i also wanted to say this because of course both you and doris are, were not allowed to to have your poems um within the the judging process it didn't it's, it wouldn't be fair but i wanted to point out something in in yours at the sort of a, a rhythmical change. You've got a sort of almost a staccato canning apple sauce in the first line. And then you've got a sort of breeze like use of S's in, in lines two and three that with the traditions cross generations. I don't know if you'd set out to, to do that, but I just, it, I, I love the change in, in rhythm in, in the two parts of the, the poem. Yeah, that wasn't, uh, that was not directly intentional. But it is very interesting the way there are still S's at the end of the first line, like mm -hmm. sauce, um, but the way the, the rhythm of those syllables, like the accents on those syllables work, it's mm. just going to make it sound less S-like than in those last two lines. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Although if you look at it again, I suppose if you could say that the S's carry, through, carry right through. Um, but you still have that nice staccato rhythm. Anyway, we could we could go on all day um, talking about <laughs> the the ins and outs of these lovely poems that we we've been looking at. But it's time to say thank you to Alison, to Doris, and Janice, um, because now we're going off to have a little debate about who is the outright judge's choice and which poems will be honourable mentions. But before we do that, obviously, congratulations to all the poets. They not only got through our submission process but then they caught the eye and the imagination of our judges great work everybody thank you so now i have one last chance to remind you of all the submissions going on right now the youtube video prompt is waiting for your poems march 1st to the 15th 2023 haiku and senryu reimagining the poems discussed in episode one of this series march 16th to 31 split sequences and there'll be a little bit of help in the next podcast for that one shane and i are still replying to highborn submissions if you haven't heard back by the end of the month february 2023 reach out to me because there will have been a glitch in the matrix thank you to all the poets who wrote for us this time all my lovely coffee supporters all the judges who gave up their time to come along today and tell us about their choices. And of course, they had a lot of reading to do through all the submissions. There are more, you know, more than you've heard today, but you'll only be able to read them in the next journal. And to you, 
Thank you so much for listening and being here to support Poetry P. I'd love to reach down the wires and give you all a big hug, but I can't. Just know you're all appreciated. Thank you. So join me next time to have a listen to a workshop from a very knowledgeable and a totally brilliant Peter Jastermski. But until then, keep writing. I hope I haven't messed up again, but if I have, please don't hesitate to email me or send me a message on Twitter. Let me know what I've done and I'll sort it out. Ciao!